Hi, this is Rich Archman with GDS's The Lending Link, and we're joining you today live from FinTech Meetup in Las Vegas. This is our third session for this afternoon, and today we're being joined by Liz Hagel, Senior Vice President and the leader of TransUnion's consumer lending line of business with the financial services vertical. Liz was a guest of mine back in February 2022, and this afternoon we'll be revisiting some of the topics that we talked about last time with a focus on buy now, pay later. How are you doing today, Liz? I'm doing great. There's a lot of energy here. Yeah, a lot of energy. It's, it's definitely a, a good place to be and uh, a lot of good people to hang out with. So thanks for joining me. So uh, Liz, you and I had a lot of good discussion about the buy now, pay later industry and, and how things were evolving. You know, one of the things we talked about back then was uh, where the uh, bureaus were headed from a credit reporting standpoint. Yeah. And I'm uh, just curious, uh, you know, what type of progress has really been made in that area? Yeah. Well, we're plugging away at it. So I think last time we talked, we talked about the need to handle the data differently for buy now, pay later, where these smaller, more frequent loans don't fit easily into the current credit reporting ecosystem. So we're still running down the same path of putting them on the core credit file. We truly believe they belong there with traditional credit. Mm -hmm. There's so many consumers using this data and so many consumers continuing to use this type of credit product. Um, that it clearly belongs on the core credit file. So we're gonna adjust it onto the core credit file. We're gonna partition it away so that it won't automatically feed into anything, into mm -hmm. scores, into attributes. If you think about something like average age of trade, clearly if you put a bunch of buy now, pay later data into that attribute, it's gonna mess up the whole thing. So it's gonna be kind of sequestered on the core credit file. We'll let it build up. Eventually we'll get enough data to let it be used in data studies. And that path is still moving forward. Um, we've built the rocket ship, um, right. as my team likes to say, we're ready for the fuel. Uh, and we're working with the buy now, pay later lenders, um, all the big ones. The good news is I think they more and more, they see the value of reporting to the bureaus. Right, right. Um, the importance of being able to help consumers build credit. I had a journalist last week, they asked me directly, hey, does this help consumers build credit? Many consumers think it does. Yeah. Can you debunk that? I'm like, you know what, not yet, mm -hmm. but it will. So we're getting there. They need both the carrot and the stick of credit building um, to help their performance. So when, when we think about the buy now, pay later data and things like your, your credit vision trending type uh, portfolio, mm -hmm. how do you see the, the buy now, pay later maybe fitting into the trending data because of this short period of yeah. time? Yeah, I envision there's going to be buy now, pay later specific attributes. So okay. I don't know that it necessarily goes into very many attributes with other, say, installment loans. I think that we've already built a set of 100 buy now, pay later specific attributes, including trended, to look at the trends in the buy now, pay later specific mm -hmm. ecosystem. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of value there. It's just what is the behavior of consumers using these products? How right. often do they use them? How... Um, big, small, and then the positive payment trend. So if you've got an every two weeks positive payment, that's a really fast feedback loop to start building up some positive credit history. Good. Now, I think, um, did I recently see some article about the CFPB and some refocus on buy now, pay later? Is there any insight you can get from a regulatory standpoint on any uh -huh. concerns that may have been raised? Yeah, the CFPB, the OCC are continuing to look at this. I talk to them regularly, and I, I know there's a lot of interest in the financial inclusion possibilities for right. this. And that's what gets me the most excited about this. We've, I can't think of anywhere else where there is a concentrated, vast set of data on consumers that can easily be used in credit scoring. I mean, there's not that many players. It's not like you have to go get all the mom and pop rental agencies mm -hmm. <laughs> in the world to furnish data. like. The data is right there. Right. We just have to work with the lenders to, to get it moving. And, and the exciting part is it's moving. Like there are hands on keyboards across the industry actually coding to Metro 2, actually getting ready to make this go live. Okay. Um, so are you working with the uh, CDIA at all on, on how this kind of fits into the Metro yeah. 2? Yeah. So that's been done okay, uh, great. probably since you and I last talked, but there's a whole section now on the Metro 2 reporting guidance on how to fit these loans into Metro 2. Um, the CBIA is involved and going to be watching this. Um, so as we begin to analyze the data, we'll make sure that we get it right. So from a uh, integration perspective, if I heard you correctly, you kind of 
keeping this data in its own separate bucket for now. Mm -hmm. So lenders that actually want to take advantage of the data through systems like our, our Medelica platform, is that then basically a separate a separate call into the repository? Um, it'll be the same call, but there's an on-off switch. Okay. So do you want the data to come in with the rest of the data or not? And so before you'd want to turn it on, you would want to ensure that your models are equipped to recognize it and you can use a bunch of different indicators that'll help you isolate it and determine whether it goes into each different piece of the credit model that you've deployed. I know you guys did a lot of research uh, on the market and I remember on our last call you had shared some really good reports that looked at uses yeah. of the product, age, distribution and whatnot. Yeah. Um, any any refresher when we think about like the Vantage score mm -hmm. and the buy now pay later consumer where do you typically see they kind of fit from a vanish uh, core I mean, since breakdown? we did that study a couple of years ago, I think it's expanded in usage across all credit bands. Now, it's certainly more concentrated in younger and higher risk consumers. But because of all the different types of vendor of merchants now mm -hmm. that finance operators are working with and all the different options to finance everything from a pair of sneakers to your grocery bill to a home improvement project, there's really a lot of different um, consumers using this product. So I wouldn't even say it's particularly a certain profile of consumer anymore. Well, it's interesting you mentioned sneakers and you mentioned home, improve product, home improvement products. So yeah. sneakers that are, I know some people spend $200 on sneakers. I don't get yeah, it. Yeah. But, um, you know, certainly you just out, outlined a very large yeah. spread on, on what the loan size would be mm -hmm. uh, for the audience. And I, I think it's maybe good to uh, talk about what defines buy now pay later yeah. right because i think that's kind of not clear yet necessarily mm -hmm. and but if the cdi has been involved i assume that they've come up with a very definitive definition or they're trying <laughs> yeah so i mean there is a gray area so like there's the pay in four pay in six product is clearly buy now pay later that's kind of universally recognized as a buy now pay later product across the industry uh, when you get into a longer term, maybe six, 12 month loan for a larger purchase, that's, I'm calling those point of sale loans. Uh, but a lot of the features of those loans are more similar to the pay and for because consumers are meant to use them transactionally. So when I think about something that deserves the special treatment on the credit file that really shouldn't flow into all of the attributes today, uh, it's something that's transactional. You're using a buy now pay later loan instead of a credit card swipe um, for a larger purchase. Um, they're likely to be used more than once a year. And so that's really where the rubber hits the road in terms of what fits on the credit file and what could potentially not work in existing scores. So if you're using something three, four times a year, that's when it starts breaking down and the consumer could have an undue negative impact on their scores. If you call it a personal loan and assume a consumer takes out five in December because they're holiday shopping, like that's not gonna do what you would expect you right. want it to do to a credit score. That it, if for an installment loan would be risky behavior. For buy now pay later, when it's replacing a credit card swipe, that might not be risky behavior. That might be exactly what you're expected to, to do for the product. So it's gonna take some time for credit models to understand what to do with these loans especially the ones that are more frequent. Now, are there any um, specific uh, kind of business industry code or remark code that's attached to a BMPL? So do I know that this was used for groceries versus a retail product? Um, no, they'll come in just like any other installment loan without a use, uh, what it was used for mm -hmm. in particular, but you'll just see the, the terms. Okay, so for and Klarna, they'll have a special uh, kind of business industry code that they use for buy now, yeah. pay later. and kind of business code, there'll be a specific one for these trades, and that will drive part of the partitioning. The right, right. Now, what do you typically see from a credit risk underwriting for buy now, pay later products themselves? Like if I'm, under, if I'm buying a $200 pair of sneakers, mm -hmm. what are you seeing lenders do from an underwriting perspective in the buy now, pay later space? Yeah, they underwrite it just like any other uh, dynamic models. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, good, good. So uh, you're feeling good about the progress that, that you guys are all making? Yeah. Um, any, any sense of how your, 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 your brothers and sisters at Equifax, uh, 
Equifax and uh, Experian are doing on their find out pay later. I like to think that we're working towards a common goal of having this data available across the industry. I know that the industry is holding us accountable to, to get the data. And um, I know there's been some announcements that some lenders are beginning to report. And I think that's great news for the industry, regardless of which bureau that the data comes into first. You do. Ultimately, the data is going to have to reach critical mass in order to be available to the lending community. Um, so I think we'll all kind of be on the same path there. And any tipping point, any movement towards lenders actually getting the data in the hands of consumers is positive news. Um, once data starts coming in, we'll have to expose it to consumers so they can mm -hmm. audit it, see it on their personal credit report, yeah. even though it won't be used in scoring or credit decisions yet. It's just a great first step for consumers to get used to seeing that on their credit report. Good, good. So when you think about product roadmap, I mean, I assume there's plans to like integrate this data into trigger files. And yeah. Um, they'll use for account monitoring, collections, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yep. Well, good. We'll be uh, looking forward to seeing uh, how things progress. And uh, I know when we spoke last time, one of the things that was near and dear to your heart um, was around women in fintech. And yep. I think I walking around here at Fintech Meetup, I, I saw that they're either having a session or they have an area. Um, yep. Any any update on, on progress that's been made there that you want to share? Yeah, well, I just got back from a, a roundtable lunch where women talking about their careers in fintech. So that was valuable, made some connections that I'm sure I'll run into at these conferences. I mean, just walking the floor here, there's a lot more women, a lot more women involved in this industry, a lot more women excited about this yeah. industry, which I really like. Um, even when I think about hiring for my own team, it's like it's hard to find diverse candidates yeah. um, across the financial services ecosystem. But I want to break down barriers. Like, there's no reason you couldn't hire a rock star product manager from a cereal company to manage a credit product. Right. I mean, there's a learning curve no matter what when you change companies. You can learn a new industry. People are flexible and they learn quickly. So, if we can open our eyes to hiring from more diverse backgrounds, we can help force or help enable a lot more diversity. Right. Right. Why well, you need to uh, help promote? The message uh, in uh, maybe high school and, and college, right? Yeah, that's that this too. is a yeah. good area to focus on. I know when I, uh, you know, when I talk to friends of mine and talk about their children, they say they enjoy math. Yeah. I'll say, man, you got to just push that kid to learn right. how to get into statistics and model building, because yeah. there's not one industry that doesn't use analytics. Exactly. Right. So that opportunity to influence the future is really good. Well, Liz, I want to thank you for coming today. Uh, yeah. This is uh, Rich Alterman, and once again, we're broadcasting live today from FinTech Meetup. And I've been meeting with Liz Begal from TransUnion. And uh, thanks again for spending time with me. Thank you. Thanks, bye-bye. Right. So once again, this is Rich Altman broadcasting live at FinTech Meetup, our third episode today of the Lending Link, where we had the opportunity to spend time with Liz Pagel, Senior Vice President and the leader of TransUnion's consumer lending line of business within the financial services vertical.